Hello and welcome to our Creative Conversations podcast where we discuss art and, uh, well, creativity really, and art and in business to uh, really inspire your own creative thinking potential. So this is a partnership between career and culture wellness company, The Brimful Life, and No Studios, Milwaukee's um, social club for artists and creatives. So we are here today live at the Fall X Festival in the Wisconsin Center, and I'm really excited about this conversation. So we have back with us again, thank you for coming back. Thank you for having me again. John yeah. Zorowski, so he is author of Shift and Make Time, so two books all about how to make individuals and teams more effective. Yeah. And then we have Wanye Frazier, who's a choreographer and owner of the new Wolf Dance Studio. And um, you really bring dancers together to make them effective as a co cohesive team, right? right? So that's really the topic that we're going to be talking about, like your creative approaches to bringing out the best in people and the best in teams in business and in art. Right? So, um, John, let's start with you. Sure. So, team building, what does that mean for you? And when you're working with companies and working yeah. with businesses, what's the outcome that you're trying to achieve when you think about bringing out the best in teams? Yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, team building, and I, I deliberately steer away from team building. I think the best way to build a team and bring people together is to give them some shared purpose or cause, some work that they can do together. And that's way more meaningful than like having, you know, some like cheesy, like, you know, trust building exercise or yeah. taking the team out of the office and going to like, you know, have a bowling offsite yeah, yeah. or something oh, like God. whatever. No more bowling. Please, no more bowling. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, with you on that. So it's really about trying to, tr trying to align people around, you know, something that they, they care about. And then one of the things that I try to do is I try to look at what are the sort of like autopilot kind of default things that people do and there's so many of them so when you get a team together you know they they kind of default to these normal things like everybody says like oh let's brainstorm let's jump in a conference room and figure it out but if you don't have a good process for working together you're just gonna waste your time you're gonna spin your wheels people aren't gonna feel like they're being heard like they have a chance to really contribute so I try to I try to put into place new processes that allow each individual to contribute what they bring to the table and then right. also uh, kind of have fair and structured ways of making decisions so that it doesn't just go to like whoever the person with the loudest voice is or the person who has the reputation right. for being creative or whatever. Okay, so I love it. So you've got like um, tried and true processes and it really starts with making sure everybody's on the same page with purpose and yeah. the why. Yep. How often do you step into a team and everybody thinks that they're on the same page with purpose and they're really not? Like they each yeah. have a different definition uh, of why they're there. It happens a ton, yeah. And so one of the things that I do when I first start working with a team, especially if we're going to do... Uh, uh, design sprint process together, which is uh, what my first book is about. We will spend the first entire day, it's a five day process, and we'll spend one full day just getting everybody on the same page. And we yep. do this mapping exercise yep. where we basically, you know, the three of us, let's say we were going to talk about something like, um, you know, well, you mentioned starting a nonprofit, and let's say we were going to like talk about starting a nonprofit to help with some particular issue, and we just jumped into like, well, what should we do? Yeah. as a nonprofit, yeah. we would each have a different map in our brain yeah. of the world of what it looks like you know our different assumptions and so what I try to do when I'm first working with a team is draw those assumptions out yeah. get that map out of people's brains and create a shared map so that we're all kind of operating off the same you know literally if you think of a map you lay it out on yeah. the table and say like alright where are we and where are we trying to go yeah that's the starting point is to get everybody aligned um, and then it makes the rest of your time together just so much more yeah. valuable so invest in that time up front makes yeah. perfect Sense. You have to go slow so that you can go fast. Right. Yeah. All right. So two important words, purpose and process. So Wanye, yeah. in your world, in the art world, in dance, um, talk to me. What does purpose and process mean to you when you're working with dancers? Okay. That's actually a lot of what John said applies directly to dance. So you mentioned individuals. Establishing, especially in dance, each dancer has a different background. They come with different techniques, different skills. And so when I'm choreographing a piece, when I'm bringing people together, the first thing that I do normally is if I'm building a team for a specific project, I meet with each dancer beforehand. I do a little bit of research in terms of what they do, how they move, what they kind of associate with. And I like to have a sit down and figure out what their purpose is with joining the choreography. Are they doing it simply to be in a show? They haven't performed in a long time. Uh, are they looking to catapult themselves into a platform for it? Like, what is their goal? And then when I get them into the room, it's kind of finding the perfect spot for each individual's personality. 
And I think that it can be time consuming, but if you can find what strengths each person has and a play to those strengths, rather than focus on what techniques or what training they didn't have beforehand, we can start to build a cohesive group. And the focus comes on if you can't do eight turns, that's fine, they can, but you mm. excel in floor work. And so we can incorporate both into a piece. We're finding each person where they excel and incorporating that into the overall vision. Um, he was also mentioning talking about a purpose, establishing a purpose for the group. So when we're working on a show, we all know what the end goal of the show is. Right. When the show is, what we're trying to accomplish, and what the overall vision is, I think that sometimes can be uh, daunting for choreographers or for artists to think of the end goal, yeah. because we simply do. Sometimes we'll jump in and we're like, I have, a, I have an idea, it has to get out, where is it going? <laughs> and so we do it, and then we're like, I don't know what this is for. So when working with other artists, you have to give them a goal right off mm -hmm. the bat. Because if you don't, you have eight different artsy personalities who all want to do something and have an <laughs> idea of like, you know what, that would be cool right there. So I'm just going to, and then you can have your vision shooting in eight different directions. Mm -hmm. So establishing yeah. like, this is what I want you to end. And so our vision might be a piece that is focusing on trauma. Yeah. So each dancer can interpret trauma in their own way. Mm -hmm. And then we find out how to pair each person and put them in a proper place where their trauma or their idea, their concept of trauma and movement yeah. plays into the overall vision. Yeah. All right. So let me just say some like real talk here, right? So listening to you both talk, like I'd love to work for you and I'd love to dance for you because you seem to have this very idealistic way of like you'll work with people where they're at and find that unique place for them to make a whole. Realistically though, <laughs> can you really work with everybody? Do you ever have situations where like, this person just is not going to fit. Um, do you ever have that situation? And if so, how, how, how do you address that? So you can still move forward? Um, I guess it's just a, can still, still achieve an outcome, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it, it can happen. And I think that, and I, I'd be really interested to hear how you approach this, but like in my work, helping people come together and work toward building a product or a service or some new marketing or you know building their business um, I always try to be very deliberate beforehand about the construction of the team and really looking at okay what skills do you bring to the table what background do you have um, and and not just saying come on everybody let's jump in a room and we'll figure it out but really yeah. constructing that team as part of the design process right, right. first design the team and then design the process so that we can all work together to design yeah. whatever it is we're trying right. to bring into the so world. So selection is really important yeah. in terms of the values or the skill sets or the competencies that would need to complete the team. Totally. And I'm assuming for choreography, that's the equivalent of a tryout, right? It is. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in, in, especially in my experience, I've had situations where I have the ability to audition and choose specific people and, and like mm -hmm. you said, screen. What are you going to bring yeah. to the table? What is your personality? The most amazing thing is, in an audition, you can tell so much about a person. Yeah. You can figure out their work ethic. You can figure out their mm. personality in terms of how they approach challenges. Or do they get frustrated easily? Mm. Do they think extremely highly of themselves? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily match up to what they are presenting. Mm. In that audition, mm. you can see a lot of that. And so that gives you the opportunity to say, you know what, well, they can do this really well, but I don't know if this personality will yeah. match mm -hmm. with the team that I'm building. In other situations, you get what you get. So you may have a group where you need to have 20 people, 15 would have made mm. it, and mm -hmm. you still need five other people to be on <laughs> yeah. the team right. because you have to fill that quota. Right. So what you end up having to do is, uh, it, it does become a lot of work on the choreographer in the sense where I have to make sure everyone's still on the same page, mm -hmm. and I can't necessarily afford to spend more time on those extra five people when I'm moving forward because yeah. I only have two months and I have an eight minute piece. So yeah. that means I need yeah. to keep moving. Yeah. But what that also may mean is more time and investment on my end in terms of maybe some work on the outside and addressing people in one-on-one -on -one situations where bringing them up to speed, addressing concerns they may have. There's a lot of preparation outside of the actual project that I feel like has to take place in a lot mm -hmm. of investment. That mm -hmm. can happen in those cases, but it's really uh, just a commitment to getting the, the job done right. and what needs to be done to right. accomplish that. I also think it's worth talking about what happens to those people who don't make the cut, right? Those yes. people who are, you know, to use a dirty word, rejected, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. I, often, I often tell people that a rejection says more about the person who rejected you than it does about mm. you, right? And it's, I mean, most people are good 
and most people have some unique skills and most people want to do things that matter. They right. have good intentions. So if somebody doesn't fit into a team, it's not because they are fundamentally a bad person right. or an unskilled right. or an you know unvaluable person. Right. It's just that they didn't quite fit into the team that is going to be most ideal for the purpose yeah. of what you're trying to do. And in those cases, I, I have the luxury of always creating extra projects. Oh yeah, totally. Okay. So right. for uh, the last three years, I've choreographed for the Milwaukee Pride Fest. And in that situation, you have dancers of all backgrounds. Anyone is allowed to join the team. It's supposed to be open. Um, it's supposed to be body friendly. So there are a lot of, in terms of challenges, in terms of making sure that everyone feels supported, everyone mm -hmm. has a place. But you do have situations yeah. where a person is not a dancer. Sure. Yeah. This is not what they're supposed sure. to do. And so where do we place those? So we may create situations where if they can't necessarily be in a group piece, that they have free dance sections mm -hmm. where it's really just you go out and you enjoy yourself or we create small tasks and, and small things that they can still do to feel incorporated where they may not have the same level of responsibility as the, the initial team that I have, yeah. but ways to keep them engaged. I, I used to work with uh, somebody who um, actually had a, a, a dance background. Her name is Chris, cool. Kristen Briantes and she is an amazing uh, design producer for, for technology companies. And she had this technique for saying no that she called the Sour Patch Kid. You know, the candy, the Sour Patch yeah. Kid. When yeah. you first like taste it, it's super sour, but then it gets sweet at the end. Yeah. And so her strategy for rejecting people or saying no to people was at first, you have to be a little bit sour. You're like, I'm sorry, it's not going to work out. But then try to be sweet. But I've got this other thing for you. Right. Uh, or yeah. maybe you go talk to this person, and that yeah. might be a better fit. So yeah. I just love that strategy. It, yeah. Just a way to make sure that we are... The energy is still there. Yes, I did say mm. no, but mm -hmm. I can direct that somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I can send you somewhere else so you're not just feeling like a loss. You know, right. I think that's really important because I think like a lot of leaders or um, pe people who are leading teams, whether in business or in art, um, I feel like people just stop with the no. Yeah. And they don't put that extra effort in terms of, because, you know, you're really impacting someone. You don't know how they're going to receive it. In some regards, I guess it's not your problem how they receive it. But I suppose going that extra mile really makes you stand out as a leader to, like, help somebody get from that sour initial taste to something else, right? I mean, that little bit, I think, can go a long way to help people flourish in other ways in their yeah. career, right? I have a two-part question for both of you guys, okay. right? So part one is from your vantage point of being people who are accountable for bringing the success of a team together. Other than technical skills, what is a really important competency for individuals to bring into the team if they want to be successful, a, a successful member of the team, right? Because you're all both dealing with people with very different skill sets, very different levels of competency around those skills. But apart from either like a technical skill, subject matter expert, or a level of dance ability, what else from the, the viewpoint that you guys have when you're pulling a team together, could we as members of the team really bring forward to help to contribute to that team? Honesty. Honesty? Say, Honesty. say more about that. I find that to be the, the, the biggest challenge, but also the most rewarding challenge. As long as you are honest, especially in a dance sense, let's say you are injured. Uh, dancers have a tendency to hide injuries yeah. because we feel like... You could be you know, cut. I, I can be cut from the show. Yeah. Or, um, you know what? No, no, I'm okay. I can dance it off. No, no, no. Stop. <laughs> this hurts. Yeah. Go yeah. sit down. Honesty in the... Sh in the immediate sense, protects us in the long run. Okay. Because then I know, okay, you know what? If I have you sit down now in two weeks, that uh, that means you can still perform in a month. Yeah. If you focus through this or force your way through this, it means that in a month, you aren't usable. I've built an entire piece around you, and right. now you are injured, you're out, and we're all just screwed. Um, but honestly, in a sense that express your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And I think what I, especially in some of my working relationships, we talk about, no, you know what? That is very difficult for me. That yeah. will not happen. I'm not okay. going to lie and say I'm going to do it. And acknowledging that, but then also finding ways to use your strengths to balance that out. Yeah. And focusing more on what you can do, where you excel, and then finding other people who are different than you and who really, and when I build a team, I find people who are different and have different skill sets because they'll all balance out in the long run. Mm -hmm. Let's say as a dancer, you have lack clear communication, which is rough. But you have a friend who communicates really well and can do that for both of you. But... You also, the other friend isn't going to go and work out, but you can encourage each other to work out and do some conditioning on the outside, mm -hmm. just finding ways mm -hmm. to compensate with okay. the team. So honestly, I want to come back to that, but go ahead, John. What are your thoughts? I think the, the most important thing that I look for is people's attitudes around um, failure and learning. Okay. Because, you know, I think... Um, 
there's so much of a stigma around failure and there's so much fear of failure, but really failure is our opportunity to learn, mm -hmm. you know, Definitely. and, uh, you know, to, to sort of, to try things out and to learn in like a very, like an experiential way, not just a, like a theoretical way of somebody telling you something and saying, yeah, yeah, I get it. But like actually trying it and then, and then, you know, being willing, having the mindset that if it doesn't work out the way that you thought it was going to, we might call that a failure, but mm -hmm. really it's not a failure. It's an opportunity. As, as, yeah, as long as you learn something from it. Right. If, you, if you just take that as a hit and you shut down yeah. and you're like, oh, I guess I'm... It's not a failure. I, it's just a different outcome than expected. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's, so I, I really look for that, that yeah. um, attitude. And I the way that I do that um, is by sort of asking people about previous work and previous projects okay. and sort of ask them to tell me a story about like, a project that didn't go the way they thought yeah. and just kind of see how they talk okay. about it. So that was going to be the uh, the, the follow-up question, like h how do you cultivate that, um, that environment where people feel um, uh, confident or have the courage to fail? So you sort of screen for it and you ask about past experience and people's yep. relationships with failure or learning. Yep. But for honesty... <laughs> It can how do you be hard to ask that in it an interview be because you don't know if they're lying? So how do you how, do you have any um, techniques for cultivating a culture where people feel comfortable actually coming forward and being honest? If you so, ask somebody if they were honest and they said no, I would be pretty honest. Right? I mean, right? I mean, it, 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 it's it's coming for it, but I think. Uh, how I normally build that in any type of class environment is when I'm teaching or when I'm choreographing, it's ask questions. And what I mean by that is, if something does not make sense, I think a lot of times in, a, in a, an authoritative position, people feel like they mm -hmm. can't ask you yeah. questions, they can't challenge you. And I think allowing people to challenge you, occasionally, not roughly, just, but just ask questions if something doesn't make sense, if something isn't meshing the way it is, stopping me in the moment and at, acknowledging, like, you know what, that didn't make sense to me. Or, can you explain this again? Or, always saying that mine is, is awesome, but I normally do this, I'm like, are there any questions? No. Are there any questions? <laughs> Something's not right here. Please, somebody tell me what doesn't feel right. And just allowing yourself to be open enough to acknowledge, you know what, I didn't explain that better, let me give you another. But just, mm. I think, starting from the top and allowing myself, you know what, I did that wrong, we're gonna go back, we're gonna fix it, and acknowledging my own mistakes in front of the group. Right. Yeah. And then making steps, preparing myself to fix those mistakes and showing yeah. them that I can do both. Yeah. I think a lot of the times we, especially in a position of power and a position where I am running something, you feel as if you have to be perfect all the yeah. time and that's right. not realistic. Well, yeah. In doing that, you're also demonstrating honesty. You know, you're modeling that for everybody that you're working with. Yeah, and I think it helps yeah. because if they see that I will do it, they feel more yeah. comfortable doing right. it. And if maybe also allowing myself before and after some of my sessions to just give a little bit of time. If you need to reach out to me, if you can't do it in front of other people because of your personality, like that's just too much. Allowing time for you to come and ask me questions or having sessions and making myself available to help you through those. And I think that yeah. kind of helps. Yeah. So as individuals who have accountability for bringing out the best in teams, right? You, you mentioned a couple of things. It seems like you have to exercise patience, do a lot of investment in the upfront, um, a curiosity to really get to know people, their different personalities or different strengths, how to incorporate those into the, the team, um, modeling the behaviors that you want to see coming from the team. That's a lot. For you guys each personally, <laughs> um, what, what is hard for you when you step into that role of bringing a team together? What are competencies that you need to do that well that you personally have to work on? I don't know if it's so much of a competency, but for me, the biggest thing is energy. Like, if, I am, if I'm not well myself, if I haven't taken the time to, you know, to sleep enough, to eat properly, to, to, to you know, move my body as a way of, of staying healthy and staying energized, like, I'm not going to be able to, to do the things that I need to do. Because, at least for me, and this might be different for you, and, you know, and I'm, I'm quite introverted, and so for me to be in a kind of a, a public situation where the whole room is looking to me, I need to bring a lot of energy to that, and so for me, it really, it really actually is kind of a what everything I need to do outside of that room to prepare myself for that that yeah. moment. Yeah. Oh my God, I am sure it's just the same. I mean, yeah. you talked about energy, yeah. a healthy mind, healthy body, healthy eating. That, that is, has got yeah. to be the literally, same. <laughs> that is literally yeah. it. It is maintaining yourself because in a position of leadership for all intents and purposes. You are investing in others. So you are expelling a lot of energy. Yep. You are always giving, 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 and you're not always getting back. 
Yeah. So it is yeah. a matter of, in your personal life, making sure that you do things to value yourself and to make sure that you are okay. Because I've had situations, uh, one of the years, I dislocated my knee. Mm. And I was so intent on, I'm going to finish this project, so I pushed through it. <laughs> And then so instead of letting myself heal yeah. for maybe the two or three weeks I needed, I pushed through and the injury lasted six months. Mm -hmm. So it's like finding those moments of you matter. And if I'm not okay, if I'm not where I need yeah. to be, I can't invest in yeah. others. Well, the good thing is John has a book all about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At least, at least part of it. Yeah. My yeah. book make time is, yeah. uh, it, it's yeah. It, the sort of principles of it are like to be very clear about what you want time for to, remove all the other distractions that mm -hmm. suck up your time and then to like to take care of yourself to recognize that you know in in my world it's a lot about sort of people need to be convinced that like the brain and the body are connected yeah. you know like yes. in your world i imagine you know it's yes. it's all about the body but like um you know in my world people think that you can just like sit in a in a swiveling desk chair for for 14 hours a day and, yeah. and do your best work and that's not true at all yeah so yeah um yeah it's definitely important to find really concrete really specific ways that people can build stuff into their day taking walks, you know, like making their own food, you know, yeah. spending time face to face with others. That's really going to like yeah. help them build that energy. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting point that you make in business. We don't always see the connection between our brain and our body. We put so much premium yeah. on the brain part and it's like our bodies are sitting there. I would like say we, we, we never think about it. Yeah. Like I think it's like, it's the rare person yeah. who really, really thinks about that and internalizes yeah. it. Yeah. So, so that leads me to like our final question and it, kind of like a fun question. So since we have you both here, we're talking about team building, bringing yeah. out the best in people from a business perspective, from an art and a dance perspective. So John, is there anything that you're kind of like curious about or techniques for building teams from the dance world that you could see applying in your world? And then mm. Wanye, sort of the opposite question for John, any question that you have for each other yeah. or based on the conversation that you've heard today, you're like, hey, I'm gonna file, file that away. That might be something to like bring to my work from, yeah. the, other, from the other side. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I do actually appreciate John's perspective. Um, in terms of designating tasks beforehand, going through the whole process, screening, I think that can be uh, more applied in my field because uh, there is a lot of reaction in the dance world in the sense that we have a gig, I need to find people. Mm. And instead of building a team beforehand or having mm. people on file that you know, you know what, you already have this skill. And so that is something that's that great that idea. you can start to build into. Yeah. Especially as you're building out your studio, right? right? That's yeah. a really great finding idea. Finding people beforehand instead I love of always that. just finding mm. what is a I love available. that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, for me, the, one of the things that is so intriguing about, about dance and about really like sports as well. And, you know, like I know that dancers are athletes, um, but like I love the orientation toward action. In the business world, there's this there's this strong tendency to try to like plan and analyze and research everything forever before you in, in like make this perfect plan and then go and Analysis execute on paralysis. it. Analysis paralysis. Yeah, but I've seen like uh, you know if we if we can get people moving um, and not physically moving, but if we can get them starting to do the work of whatever their business is mm -hmm. before they have that perfectly made plan, mm. Um, mm. it just uh, it just kind of I don't know, it has so many benefits. It gets people bought in, it gets people right. emotionally involved, it gets people over the fear of failure. So almost um, sort of like a metaphorical type of warm up that you exactly. might do before yeah, you yeah. get yeah. into the work. Yeah. I think the, the fun thing is everyone is hesitant their first time doing anything dance wise. Mm. And like you said, you get through the warm up, we start doing some stretches, we do a little exercising, you know, okay, you know what you feel okay. We always start a practice with doing something that everyone can do. Yeah. We always set the playing field. You know what? Everyone can do this, so do it. I don't mm -hmm. have to explain it. Everyone knows what a push up is. Okay, do the push up. Yeah. Everyone knows that you can everyone can do that. We all did one. We do it. Okay, great. <laughs> and then we can move past that and we get into something a little bit weirder. But you already know you got one thing out of the way, one task is done. Okay, yeah. that mm. part is completed. And I mm. know every time little I come back. Little tiny wins. A little right? tiny wins. Yeah. Every time I come back, that part will be better. Mm. Mm. And then we work through the other tasks. And like you said, getting people moving. Uh, dancers think too, honestly. And that, course, you do, yeah, but yeah. in the sense that a lot of us can be up yeah, here. Yeah, totally. And it's yep. very difficult sometimes because we're always like, it has to be perfect. Yep. I have this vision in my head, yep. and then the leg goes above her head, and then and then we get so caught up in yep. the vision and the leg does not get as high as we <laughs> want it to in practice, but the goal is to keep pushing through it. Like yeah. you said, keep the ball moving. Yeah. Okay, that didn't go, but there are eight other steps you can work on now. So please, 
Yeah. So it's just building that that like the work ethic in terms of getting things moving, being invested, and just doing, yeah. doing and letting us fix later sometimes. Yeah, totally. I love it. I learned a lot. I love sort of like the having this conversation across business and art. Yeah. And sort of Super like the blending of the two. Yeah. Really interesting. You guys couldn't have been more perfect guests for this conversation. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you.